Hello! Today I wanted to do a video on short books. Um, I have a stack of books here that are all under 100, uh, 150 pages. No, that's a lie. Actually one of them is 154 pages, but that just doesn't sound quite as catchy. Um, but yeah, uh, short novels. I have some uh, non-fiction, I have a play, um, but mostly these are fiction books. Um, I'm going to talk about the non-fiction books first. So the first book is Tell Me How It Ends by Valeria Luiselli. Um, this is 118 pages. Um, and I wanted to start with this one because if um, you don't pick up any of these books that I mentioned or you know don't even watch the video after I talk about this that's okay um, as long as you read this book. Valeria Lucelli used to work as a interpreter um, at a um, federal immigration court and she would interpret for um, unaccompanied minors and so this book is um, a lot based on her experience uh, at that job and um, it's centered especially around this questionnaire that all uh, these children have to fill in when they come to America. Um, and this questionnaire has, uh, has 40 questions, so that's why um, the subtitle is an essay in 40 questions. So this is um, an American-centered novel and especially um, about immigrants from Mexico and uh, um, Central America, but I think it could be applied to um, basically every country where there is immigrants. Um, uh, we have a pretty appalling situation in the Netherlands right now where there's, uh, there's one space in the Netherlands where everyone who seeks asylum here has to go, um, but that space is uh, right now overflowing. Um, not necessarily because there's more people seeking asylum, but um, the government has been doing so many cuts and um, you know budget cuts on on those places that um, they don't have the capacity to help these people anymore. And uh, now it's gone so bad that our people living in the streets, they don't get any medical care, they um, get poor food, um, and even doctors without borders who usually help in countries where um, medical aid might be very hard to come by, had to step in and, you know, help out at this um, asylum center. And to think that I live in one of the richest countries in the world and supposedly more forward th thinking countries of the world. Um, yeah, I'm really embarrassed to say that this is the situation right now here. Um, so yeah, this book, um, is important because it shows um, a humanity to people looking for asylum uh, in a country. It shows um, that these are not people, you know, trying to profit from something. You know, they are people who are looking for a better life because the life they are living is is dangerous to them be it because of war, be it because of, you know, climate change, hunger, um, any sort of reason. And, you know, they are looking for a safe place to live. And it's such a, a timeless thing, you know, there's there's always been immigrants, There's and there always will be people going to different countries looking for a better life. Um, and this reminds us that you should not see it as a, a crisis. It's not a refugee crisis. These are just people and, um, you know, individuals with their own story to tell. And I think that humanity makes this book so important. Um, it, it reminds us that we should be compassionate. If you only read one book from um, the books I talk about today, let it be this one. Then we have A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. So, at first I was a little bit apprehensive to pick this book up, mostly because 
I felt like, you know, I, I know what the um, statement is of this book. I know it's about, um, you know, how women should have money, they should have a room of one's own to create good art. And I didn't feel like I wanted to read a whole um, book on it, even if it's small. Um, but yeah, I did in the end because I do like um, Virginia Woolf's writing and I really enjoyed it. So the book is set up like uh, you follow a woman who is asked to do a speech on women and fiction and she sort of wonders um, about how she's going to go about this um, a topic uh, and you follow her around the city and uh, you know the, she goes to the library and she goes to the British Museum and as you um, follow her around you can see she gets inspired by different things and uh, you know this essay starts to take form you know so you sort of go along in our thought process this is definitely one of those books that you want to read with a pen poised in your hand because you know you're you'll be underlining so many uh, bits of this book Virginia Woolf is known for her stream of consciousness style of writing and um, it, that is definitely something that you'll you'll enjoy or not but I always I always love it because it, it makes you feel you know you're like at a beach and her writing is just coming to you in waves and um, you have to go and trust the process and you know you'll learn some wonderful things on the way um, this is a book that is um, a bit of, a, of its time it's, it's written um, I believe somewhere in the 1920s but um, Despite that, there's still loads of things that can still be applied today. And um, you can see how this book is the base of um, a lot of uh, modern feminist ideas. Um, so yeah, a great classic to read. Then I have this small book, which is a play called Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry. And this was first published in... 1959 and in this book we follow the youngest family and uh, the mother of this book has just gotten a large sum of money um, which was insurance money from her recently uh, deceased husband and the book is or the play is basically about um, the mother and her family discussing what they should do with the money every member of the family has a different idea of how this money should be spent so this book is a lot about how this changes the family dynamic so apparently this was a um, required a revolutionary play um, in that it was the firm, first time that a, a black family was so authentically re represented in uh, a, a play um, it, it talks a lot about civil rights but also about uh, women's rights, identity, it talks about respect and uh, dignity. It talks about this constant balance between uh, hopes and possibilities and, you know, inevitable disappointments. Um, you know, this play was written 60 years ago, but it still feels very fresh and very up-to-date. You know, this sense of pover poverty and injustice and um, you know, what it's like to live as a black family um, still feel very relevant. I don't read plays that often, um, but this one is set in just, you know, one space and it's mostly about the characters um, and the dialogue that they have. You just get this short glimpse in the life of, of this family. Um, yeah, and I think it's a very strong book. And then I have The Wind That Lays Waste by Salva Almada. This is a book translated from the Spanish by Chris Andrews. Um, Salva Almada is an Argentinian writer. Every time I have a charcoal press book in my hands, I just marvel at how beautiful they are published. But that's not what we're here to talk about. So this book is about a, a priest and uh, his daughter, and they are driving through the Argentinian desert when their car breaks down. Um, so they manage to get to a, um, a car uh, mechanic workshop that's like in the middle of nowhere um, and 
uh, you know, they are waiting there until their car uh, gets fixed. And, you know, while they are waiting for the car to get fixed, this priest is, get, is starting to talk to the mechanic, who is an atheist, and um, they get into this discussion, um, you know, really religious discussion, um, you know, on right from wrong, um, like where does it all come from, the purpose of life, um, you know, it's a real battle of wits, and in the meantime, there's this storm brewing in the background, so as their discussion gets more heated and heated, you know, the air gets more, uh, literally also gets more impressive, and you know, there's thunder coming. And the interesting thing is as well, there's that, um, uh, at the workshop there's also um, uh, like an apprentice or like a, another boy working, and um, him and the priest's daughter start to get uh, talking as well, and, and the daughter starts to, you know, see the point of the ages more. And whilst the the, the mechanics boy you know, starts to be more interested in the priest's point of view, um, you know, you can really tell that that's something new for them, and they hear a different type of story for the ter for his time in their life. Um, so yeah, a, a short book uh, again obviously, because that's what we're talking about today. It, it feels really um, uh, crescending, like it's building up to something. Um, and, you know, with a storm in the background, it gets pretty explosive. Then I have something that is quite the opposite. Um, and that is A Whole Life by Robert Seethaler. Um This is the Dutch uh, translation. Um, and this is a book by an Austrian writer and is also set in the Austrian Alps. Um, and it chronicles um, the whole life of, uh, of a man. He's called Andreas Egger and um, we follow him from uh, childhood until he dies. He's a very sort of hardworking, unassuming kind of guy. Um, you know, he rather spends his, his time up in the mountains than in the in the close by village, um, you know he sort of witnesses the rise of tourism. You know the there's the first time electricity uh, gets introduced to his village. He lives through two world wars. He has a love in his life. He has heartbreak in his life, um, but it's mostly just like a very simple life. Um, you know, if you like a, a very quiet beautiful story then this one is a great uh, one. Then I have La Bastada by Trifonia Melibea Obono and this is translated from the Spanish by Lawrence Schimmel. Um, uh, the author is from Equatorial Guinea um, and this book isn't actually all that good if I'm being honest, yeah, the, the plot has a lot of holes in it, um, the characters are a bit flat, but I still think it's worth your time. So this is uh, about a young girl. Um, uh, she's called La Bastala because her um, parents weren't married and she doesn't know who her father is. Uh, and her mother just recently died. So she's living with, I believe it was her grandfather or you know the the patriarch of the family and his wife and they you know they don't want her to know who her father is and she's really eager to find out so she, she starts to um, investigate a little bit and while she's doing that she meets this group of girls um, who are very rebellious um, um, and they lead her to her gay uncle um, and she sort of rebels against, um, you know, these rigid, rigid norms um, she's used to and the rules, uh, these rigid rules. Um, and this is a book a lot about found family. Um, I have a hard time explaining what this book is about just because it was so scattered. Um, but yeah, I love that this was very queer. It was, you know, very radical. Um, in a way that I just didn't expect from uh, a novel coming from um, Africa.
pick it up if you're interested in queer fiction, um, in lesbian fiction, uh, and you might have a good time with it. And then I have Transfer Window by Maria Gerard, and this is translated from the Danish by Lindy Falk van Rooyen. This book is um, also told in, you can see it, really small vignettes, like some of these are literally just one sentence. Um, it is about a young woman who is diagnosed with cancer. She lives with other terminally, terminally ill people in this um, hospice. Um, they live out their last days under a pretty strict but you know kind regime. Um, it does have a slight dystopian feel to it. This hospice you know, seems very nice um, at the surface but still you know you have this feeling that something's off. Um, but mostly this book is not that much about the hospice, it's more about um, uh, this woman's uh, experience. She talks about her illness, she talks about what life is like in the hospice, um, you know, she compares a lot to the outside, um, you know, she talks about how she gets diagnosed and, you know, how people react to her and when she told uh, them she had cancer. Um, and, you know, she talks about how this cancer takes over her body and how it takes over her whole life. Um, the way she tells that is very raw and you know, very unflinching. Um, the author herself also had breast cancer and she in fact um, passed away uh, only a few months after this book was published. So you can tell that she's talking from personal experience and that makes this book all more open and, and honest. You know, it doesn't give meaning to, um, you know, illness, doesn't give meaning to death, it just talks about, um, you know, the ugliness of it and, you know, the, the reality of it and which makes it a very sad read, it's very uncomfortable to read, but um, that's what I appreciated in this book as well. And I have one more book um, in translation and that is A Minor Detail by Adania Shibley. And this is translated by Elizabeth Jacquet. And uh, this is a book that is basically split, split pretty much exactly down the middle. And in the first half of the book is set um, a year after the war. Um, the, Israeli, the Israelis called this the um, War of Independence, um, but it is also war, a war that um, displaced um, 700,000 Palestinians. Um, so we follow this soldier and uh, we very much just read about his day-to-day -day life, like every day he gets up, he, he shaves, he washes his face and he has this wound that's, that he is um, taking care of. And as we go, you know, through every day in this camp, you know, following this soldier, um, the the soldiers in the camp they capture a Palestinian girl, um, and um, do horrible things to her. They, um, you know, strip her of her of her clothes. They make her a servant girl, and then they rape her, and they end up killing this girl and burying her burying her uh, in the sand. So we have this very brutal crime. Um, but as soon as this crime is finished, we just sort of get back to this soldier living his day-to-day -day life. Um, and, you know, he doesn't even think twice about what happened. And, you know, he's more concerned about his wound he's, um, he's having on his leg. Um, and then the second half of the book is about a, a Palestinian woman who um, is very fascinated with this crime. Um, especially because it is such a 
you know, and this is where the title comes from, such a minor detail in history that often gets overlooked. And, you know, she works very hard to find out more about this. But because as a Palestinian, she lives in a country where her history uh, um, is erased by the Israelis who are the oppressors in this country. Um, you know, the, she lives under occupation, then she finds it very hard to find more about this crime. Um, and yeah, it talks a lot about, you know, living uh, under occupation, um, you know, what it's like um, if you are uh, uh, displaced. Um, and uh, it's really interest interestingly done as how, you know, the two, um, two different parts are split down the middle, but they still interact so much with each other. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I might reread this in uh, September. Hopefully I'll find it just as good as I did the first time around. Another book I might also uh, reread in September is Cove by Conan Jones. Um, he is a Welsh author. Um, I hope I pr pronounced his name right. Um, and this book uh, is also one that is, um, I told in short vignettes. Um, it is about a man who is out at sea uh, in a boat when he gets struck by lightning. Um, you know, he's, and he wakes up and um, he uh, is obviously injured and he's also lost part of his memory. So when you hear the the blurb of this book, you, you might think this is like a um, high action thriller story and it, it is terrifying but in a much more quiet way. Um, uh, you know, it talks about a lot about how nature has this man um, in his grasp, which is terrifying but also quite serene. You know, he is delivered into the elements and you know the, the descriptions of the sea and the, the blazing sun and the, the, the salt and the wind are very striking. Um, this book um, has its language just stripped down to the bare essentials. Um, you know it's very calm and quiet, it doesn't make much fuss um, but um, the writer uses this, you know, spare language to depict a very fragmented mind, um, and um, it makes the story sort of both equally petrifying and soothing at the same time. And yeah, highly recommend this book. And then I have that reminds me by Derek Owusu. Um, uh, this is a uh, book about uh, a young man, um, he's called K, just the letter K. Um, and we follow him from young childhood into uh, adulthood. Um, and it is told in like fragments of his memory. And that makes it that this book reads a lot like a uh, biography. Um, even more realistic than an actual um, a biography, you know, often with memoirs or autobiography, you, you read a story and you you think to yourself, you know, no one ever remembers their life um, in such a narrative way, you know, memories are very fragmented and you know, to make it a story you have to, you know, really add a lot to it and this um, feels a lot more realistic because it is just those memories, just these little snippets of, of thoughts you have and memories you have. So yeah, that makes it very uh, impactful. Um, uh, this is a young boy who grows up in the uh, care system in the UK and um, when he's 11 he uh, gets to live with his mother again. Um, but, you know, he feels very estranged from her and, um, and he spends a lot of time out in the street and, you know, sort of finds out that life on the street also doesn't give him the home that he is looking for. 
um, it uh, Kay struggles a lot with his um, uh, mental health, especially um, depression, and he has suicidal thoughts and uh, does self harm. Um, it's a book that talks a lot about identity and belonging. It is definitely a book that is very beautifully written, um, very heartbreaking and um, definitely worth your time. I also have Ghostful by Sarah Moss. And um, in this book we follow a uh, teenage girl and she and her father and mother, they get to join this archaeology professor and he has set up this camp um, together with some of his students um, to, uh, to do research. Uh, this professor has an interest in the Iron Age and especially in um, uh, ritual sacrifice. You know, and her father, is, he's not an academic, but you know, he has a real interest in this topic as well and um, gets to join. So the idea is that they make this camp as historically accurate as possible. Um, so, you know, they gather food and, you know, you have to make a fire, they, you know, wash in a nearby river. So this is very much uh, about the contrast between Sylvie, the young girl, um, she talks a lot to the other students um, and they discuss um, you know, sort of the, the feminist perspective of the situation and they, they sort of rebel against uh, the professor and, and her father as well, you know, who are a lot more fanatic in making it as historically accurate as possible. Um, you know, you can see that in, in the beginning everyone is sort of into it, you know, they're, they're, they're having fun, you know, cooking their dinners, but um, it gets a lot more unsettling um, as the book goes on and I can't t really tell that much more about it um, without giving away, uh, giving away the plot but um, it, it gets pretty dark. I uh, love Sarah Moss's writing in this. Um, she sets the, the scene um, in such a short amount of time and you know you really feel like you're right there with them. Um, this book got quite mixed reviews and um, when it first came out but um, I really loved it. And then lastly I have a bit of a modern classic which is The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie by Muriel Spark. It is a book about um, Jean Brodie. She's a teacher and she sort of gathers this set of girls around them who are known as the Brodie set and you know sort of she sort of disregards the school curriculum and she just you know teaches these girls everything that she thinks is important um, but as Miss Brody is in her prime she also talks a lot about herself and her love life. Um, the story is told from the perspective um, of one of the girls and um, you know it's just sort of wonderful to see how the these girls look at this teacher who just doesn't act like any other adult they know. Um, you know, and sort of trying to make sense of her. Um, yeah, I think uh, Jean Brody is a really fascinating, quirky character. Someone, um, you know, there's no one quite like her. Um, uh, and uh, Muriel Sparks writing is, is very sharp and it's very to the point. Um, you know, I'd love to read more of her work, but um, I'm thinking this is a good place to start um, for anyone who wants to pick up any of her novels. So there we have it. There is, I believe, it is 12 short novels, all under 150 pages. Um, you can read these in Shorty September. Um, they're also great if you want to do like a book a day, a book a day challenge, um, or just anytime if you're looking for something uh, sh uh, quick and short to read. Love to know what your favorite short book is. Um, love to know if you read any of these books and what you thought of them. And I hope you'll have a wonderful day. Bye!